first mini school, mini school in geometry. The subject today is case stability. So, as you probably know, what you'll find out today, the subject started with work of Donaldson, Tian, and Yao on the search of the special metrics. So, this is a topic in differential geometry, but it turns out that's closely connected to the issues that we get in algebraic geometry. So, so the topic today is especially fortunate, it's placed on, the, on two of our strengths in the department, so geometry and algebraic geometry. And uh, we hope to have such topics also in the future, so we plan to have such a lecture every semester, uh, such a mini school every semester. And just to kind of differentiate it from artness and other stuff, so, so, so there, are two, there are two things that are, uh, that are different versus artness. So first of all, this is aimed introductory, uh, to be introductory, so if you have no idea on the topic, you are, <laughs> you are in the right place. Even if you have ideas about the topic, maybe, uh, maybe you are also in the right place because you'll find some other perspective, some, some new things, things here. And at the end of today's, so we'll, we'll have something, a discussion on some research results. So that's one difference, and the second difference is that we we aim to to be not only algebraic geometry, so we aim to, to whatever geometry means. So so this topic is in between algebraic geometry and uh, differential geometry. In the future, we might have topics between algebraic geometry and dynamics, or who knows, number theory. Maybe. So. I think I said enough, so you should get your badge. Uh, we have coffee breaks, uh, we have uh, free lunch for people that register, maybe also for some people that didn't register. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the reimbursements and stuff, uh, Lynn uh, is outside and you should, talk with, uh, uh, you should talk with her. And if you have any questions, then basically to, to contact one of us. Without further interruption, it's my pleasure to introduce Jan Morrison from Fordham and to give a talk about basic. Yeah. So l let me start by saying thanks to the organizers for uh, a chance to talk about this. Um, and I, there are several sort of sets of rules that, that I'm going to play by. I mean, the first you already see is the Eisenbud rules. So if you, if you speak in David Eisenbaud's seminar, you're allowed to use slides, but only if you provide the audience with some kind of hard copy so they have some context when you flip the slides. And as you'll see, I have a fair number of slides, and they're going to go by fairly fast, so you're probably going to you know, need to flip back, especially if you're the person that this talk is aimed to, uh, which is somebody who doesn't really know too much about geometric invariant theory coming in. Um, I'd, I'd like to play by the modified Agnes rules. Uh, I view this as a pre-talk. And so anybody who has a tenured or tenure track position should now leave the room. Uh, you know. <laughs> and, um, and then the, the other thing I, you know, is this is, you know, I will, you will view me hovering kind of above the, the floor at many points in the talk because I'm going to try and cover a lot of ideas and there won't be time really for too many proofs. Um, and I'm going to just kind of point to, I think, topics that are going to be uh, mentioned in other uh, talks later in the day and not try to really enter into them too much. And, I, and, and for a lot of these topics, um, I see people in this room who know much more about them than I do. And so if you're interested in any of those, ask me who you should talk to. Uh, you know. Um, and I'm going to work overseas since that's really for the, uh, for the geometers, I think, the case of interest. But just for the algebraic geometers, most of what I'm going to uh, say is remains true over algebraically closed fields. But you need quite a bit more um, technique from algebraic groups. And roughly the plan of the talk is that there are sort of two halves. One is I'm going to just sort of stick to the simplest case, which is a representation of a reductive group and try to understand 
um, stability criteria, various aspects of that case reasonably well. Then I'll say a little bit about passage to the more general actions that are actually relevant when you want to think about Hilbert and Chow points. And then the second main part of the talk is to try to get some feel for analysis of Hilbert points, to be frank, because I, my, my view is that if you understand Hilbert points, you more or less understand Chow points, which I'll, as I'll try to explain. And then I've tried to give a fair number of examples. OK, so s let's start with uh, just a linear representation of an algebraic group G. Um, and I'm just going to view that. At, I'm going to view the representation W as kind of an affine space, although I won't really use that notation, and with an induced action on the ring of functions on the space, which will always be S. And essentially, what geometric invariant theory is about is trying to form a quotient of that action. And you have a kind of obvious candidate for that quotient because there are, there's an invariant subring in S. And that inclusion uh, gives you uh, an, a natural map from W onto the spec of that invariant subring. And that certainly meets the first requirement of a quotient map, namely it's constant on orbits. And so really the, the questions that you need to ask as I put them are the Goldilocks and the three invariance questions. You know, so first of all, um, are there too many invariants? You know, that is, is that ring of invariants finitely generated as a subring? You know, so there's no general theorem that's going to guarantee that it's finitely generated. Are there enough invariants? I mean, it's a subring. It could be zero. It can be zero. And then, you know, you don't get too interesting a quotient. And then, you know, sort of it, it, mama bear, is it just right? I mean, so what about the geometry of that uh, map? It's got to be dominant because it's coming from an injection of rings, but does it have to be surjective? Um, so let's start with the issue of finite generation, which is, you know, kind of was one of Hilbert's millennium problems, the 14th uh, problem. And so the, the first thing to say is it's not automatic. And it can fail even for relatively simple groups like the additive group, um, or at least some number of copies of the additive group, although it's not so easy to actually produce examples where it fails. And so the first ones in the late 50s due to Nagata are quite uh, complicated. Uh, but the, and they were actually only, uh, he needed to use positive characteristic assumptions. But recently, Berto Taro has given much simpler examples that work over any uh, field and for at, at most three copies of, of GA. So, so anyways, the bottom line is there is an issue here. Um, and the next point to make is that that issue goes away if you make the assumption that we're going to make basically uh, almost through the rest of the talk, that the group that's acting is reductive. And if, you, you know, if that's a term that's unfamiliar to you, the only two examples that are really going to be important in this talk, and I think in this sequel, are tori, um, you know, products of, of C stars, and SLN. Um, and the key fact over C is that such groups are linearly reductive. And so that you can take as a definition of reductive for many purposes in this talk, which simply means that any uh, representation, um, the, the induced representation on the ring of functions has a canonical splitting of the, ring of in, the subring of invariance and some complement, which is just the sum of all the non-trivial irreducible submodules. And by projecting, you get what's called a Reynolds operator, just the projection onto the invariance with S primed as its uh, kernel. And it's easy to check that that's a module homomorphism over the ring of invariance. And then one of my, you know, one of my favorite sort of algebra quals problems is that if you have a subring and such a homomorphism, then if the overring is Noetherian, so is the subring. And, th and that proof of that is, is identical to the standard proof of Hilbert basis theorem. So. Um, OK, so then the next question, it, you know, here are just a couple of examples showing that, again, there's some issue about there being enough invariance. 
So uh, you know, a really trivial example is just let the multiplicative group act on CN by homothetes. Then you can just, by letting T go to 0, push anything to 0. So 0 is in the closure of every orbit, and so any map by invariance is going to have to take every point to the image of 0. In other words, the quotient is 0. So we'll see how to get rid of that kind of pathology. That's really um, a problem with the, with the representation rather than the group. But there are problems coming from the group that uh, I give two examples of. One is just to let, uh, they both involve letting an additive group act essentially by shearing. Uh, so in the first case, if I act on a pair of vectors by uh, taking AB to A plus TB, then it's pretty easy, I think, to convince yourself that A generates the ring of invariance. And so the, the quotient map is just forget the B coordinate. Okay? And for A not equal to 0, that takes each orbit onto a point in the quotient, but on the y-axis, every orbit is closed, and they're all going to get collapsed under that map. And then a sort of similar example in the other direction is when you let uh, GA act on matrices by sort of scaling, by adding a multiple of the second row to the first row. And in that case, again, it's not hard to convince yourself. Well, clearly C and D are invariant, and the determinant's invariant, and that's, that's everything. Um, so the quotient there is going to be A3. Uh, but now the Z axis won't be, you can't get anything in the Z axis except Z equals 0 because if, a, if C and D are 0, then the determinant is automatically 0. So. So, so there are some issues about what this map looks like. Um, but again, they kind of mostly go away for reductive group actions. So again, the Reynolds operator is kind of the basomatic of, of you know, it does everything for you. So if I, if I have two disjoint closed invariant, G invariant subsets, just by the standard null schellenzatz I can write 1 as a sum of elements of their ideals, f and g, and I apply the Reynolds operator, and I get invariants that add to 1, since the Reynolds operator is a homomorphism, and therefore I got an invariant that's 1 on 1 and 0 on the other. So now you can't say I haven't proved anything in this talk, and you've more or less seen the <laughs> complete set of proofs you're going to see. So. Um, and then this is, so, you know, an example that I'll generalize in a moment, but really this kind of is a model example to think of. And if you've watched the talks from Simon Donaldson's uh, lectures here, this is, I saw him use this example in his, in his first lecture, and this was certainly one I saw early on. So this is just a, a multiplicative group acting by conjugation on two by two matrices via a little diagonal matrix with T and T inverse down the diagonal. And if you just multiply out, you see that that conjugation acts by T squared and T to the minus 2 off the diagonal. And in particular, a nilpotent orbit like 0, 1, 0, 0, I'm going to, by acting by T, I can push that to 0. And more generally, um, a non a uh, semi-simple orbit like A10A, the Jordan form has ones above the diagonal, I can push that to the corresponding semi-simple part of the map. Um, so there, so the, the point is the quotient is not going to be perfect even if the group is nice. Um, so, you know, not all orbits are created equal, and uh, uh, I hope, Yuji, this is the right, this is what you want. <laughs> uh, you know, so, because there are, you know, um, uh, anyways, the, uh, the terminology I'm going to use is that uh, uh, an element in the representation is unstable if the origin is in the closure of its orbit. And then any, any homogeneous, at least, invariant that doesn't vanish uh, will have to be constant. So those are points, like in the first example, their image is going to be the origin. It's going to be uh, semi-stable is note that that's the opposite of unstable, blame Mumford. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I tried vainly in, in my book with Joe Harris when I did the construction of the moduli space to change this terminology. You know, that thundering silence you hear has been the applause from the audience, you know. And uh, um, 
But anyway, so semi-stable just means zero is not in the closure of the orbit, and you know, tautologically that there is a non-vanishing homogeneous invariant, and the image under the quotient map by taking invariants won't be zero. And then there are two um, you know, slightly better concepts. So we really want, are interested in points whose orbits are closed. And so a term that do, has emerged relatively recently, and I don't actually know when it was first coined, is polystable for this. It's certainly not in Mumford's book. Uh, and that simply means that invariants separate the orbit from other closed orbits. Um, and then the nicest condition is stable. That's what we're usually really interested in, which is that the orbit is closed and the stabilizer is finite. Or in some cases where all stabilizers are infinite, people use that for having a stabilizer of minimal dimension. Uh, and what that means is that the invariants separate that orbit from all the other orbits. So that's kind of where we'll have a quotient in the sort of naive sense. Um, and so again, the, you know, Yuji was asking me this before the talk, am I going to use properly stable? So the answer is no. But, but I mean, what I'm calling stable and polystable in Mumford's original book were stable and properly stable. Um, anyway, so here's, you know, one nice example. I mean, one thing about the geometric invariant theory is not really as geometric in some sense, you know, I mean, in the, you know, we, in the sense that what you should do, obviously, now is look for invariant divisors. You know? And so there's one nice example, which is you know, I can let SLN act on hypersurfaces of degree D. And if it does, the smooth ones are going to be semi-stable because the discriminant is clearly an invariant divisor. Its equation is an invariant that doesn't vanish at the smooth ones. So by, by the way, I think that, that uh, stability in, well, in the Malford book, the stability was different. Huh? Yeah. For stability. I, it, it was open point. Uh, okay, fine. I'm, uh, yeah. So slightly. Yeah. Okay. In any case, the, uh, the, uh, let, let me. That makes my point. The ter the terminology is not standard through time, but what I'm using now is, seems to be what the case stability people have settled on. So that's that was why. I, um, uh, oh. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So um, yeah. So the, I just wanted to generalize this model of conjugation of two by two matrices by SL two. Let's by by a one parameter subgroup, as we're going to call it. Let's think about conjugation of n by n matrices by SLM. This is really, I think, the example to kind of you know, if you keep this in mind, you have a reasonable picture of kind of what's going on. So. I mean, and this is one where we all come into the room understanding what the invariants are. They're the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. Um, so the, uh, and they, it, and it's not too hard to check, they're algebraically independent, so the quotient is just affine n space. And so what is an unstable point? All co that's a point all, whose characteristic polynomial is x to the nth, so that's an, a nilpotent point. Polystable simply means that the element is semi-simple, that is, diagonalizable. But a diagonalizable element that has m repeated eigenvalues has a positive dimensional stabilizer. So, um, so stable is regular semi-simple, distinct eigenvalues. Um, and then in general, if you want to understand when a matrix B is in the closure of the orbit of a matrix a, the answer is that you, you look at the Jordan form of A, you take some of the ones off the line above the diagonal, and you get a B, which is in the closure. And that actually is a pretty good picture of the main properties of closures of orbits, that uh, any, any orbit is, has closure, which is a finite union of other orbits. All those other orbits will have smaller dimension and larger stabilizer. Um, so th there, there will be a unique orbit of minimal dimension, and that one is closed. But again, going back to the case where there's lots of ones above the diagonal in Jordan and form, there can be lots of different orbits that have the same closed orbit in their closure, and whose, which don't meet, or whose closures don't otherwise meet. Um, 
So I'm not really going to worry too much about the properties of the quotient map, but just to say a few terms. If, and then what, I'll point to where you can read up on this kind of stuff in the references at the end. But a categorical quotient is a, a map that looks like a quotient from the universal point of view that any other in, equivariant map factors through it. Um, and then that uh, fairly standard terminology is to say that that's a good categorical quotient if it's uh, if the map phi is constant on orbits, surjective and affine, and basically locally given by values of invariance. Um, the closed G invariant sets have closed images, and the invariants separate the disjoint closed sets. So kind of F, based on what we've seen, the most you could hope for, kind of. Um, and then a geometric quotient is just the naive kind, where in addition, points of the quotient correspond to orbits upstairs. And so you can sort of sum up what I, I've said above by saying that for reductive G, uh, the quotient by taking values of invariance is a good G categorical quotient. And over the locus of stable points, it's actually a geometric quotient. And you can recover some of that if you have a non-reductive group whose ring of invariance is finitely generated. You do get at least a categorical quotient, but not a good one as the examples I gave above for, for GA will show. OK, so the, what we, you know, what Mumford's sort of uh, most fruitful idea was was that we, it's enough really to analyze the action of the simplest reductive group, the multiplicative group. Um, and we're going to give, they're so, so important that they get a name. They're called one parameter subgroups, and that's going to usually be abbreviated 1PS. <laughs> and uh, I just think of that as a homomorphism from the multiplicative group into G, and I'm going to use a capital lambda of G to denote the set of those. So the, I mean, the idea is this is an abelian group, so its irreducibles are characters. And we understand what those characters are. They're all given by powers of a generator T. So we can decompose any representation into eigenspaces where the generator of the group acts on the, the i space by the i power of T. And you can decompose a vector into components in each of those eigenspaces. And then the state of either the representation or more usually of the vector is the set of what are called weights, which are simply those i for which the component corresponding to the power i is non-zero. Um, and the reason those are important is the sort of elementary observation that how can a GM orbit fail to be closed? There, it can fail to be closed if there is some kind of limit as t goes to 0 under infinity of the, of the orbit that's not in that. Yeah, so when is there going to be a limit? Well, if there is a limit, it's going to have to be w0. Because if we're going to 0 and we have negative powers, we're in deep trouble. And if we're going to infinity and we have positive powers of t acting, we're in bad trouble. So, so there's what the limit is. And when does that limit ex exist? Well, if the minimum of the weights of w is greater than or equal to 0 or less than or equal to 0, depending on whether we're going to 0 or infinity. And so we get a bunch of implications related to uh, this numerical function uh, mu of w and lambda, which is simply the minimum of the lambda weights of w. So unstable is going to follow from knowing that there is some action of the multiplicative group with all positive weights. That's just the last line in the little. That's where is this? Let's actually use this point. That's this line here. And then and then these are all just translations of the same thing. W is going to be semi-stable, is going to force their, that, that condition in the previous line not to happen. So for every lambda, the weight has to be, uh, the, the minimum weight has to be less than or equal to 0. Um, polystable turns out to mean that for every lambda not actually fixing the vector, there's actually a negative weight. And stable is, well, there are, we just, yeah. 
I mean, the party state it is wrong the definition. I mean, look at the two points on P1. Okay. Not fixed by, not fixed by rotation, but you can drag to not one side. Ah, okay. So what, do I, what do I need to say is? I mean, you look at this single one. Yeah. I mean, either in the orbit, it might not necessarily less than zero. It could be zero. Yeah, okay. Okay, sorry about that. I have to. I, that's what you get for introducing a term you didn't use. But isn't it? So is, okay. Isn't that one parameter subgroup? Yeah. Two points. It's not. Ah, okay. No. No. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. So I apologize for that. Anyways, and then stable. The one we care about. It, th this one is right. Is that the <laughs> uh, is that for every non-trivial. Uh, lambda, there is a negative weight. Um, so there, you know, I mean, in fact, you know, Stable has this idea of balancing, and really, if you think about both lambda and lambda inverse simultaneously, then really a better way to say it is there are weights of both signs for any, and that renders kind of moot the fact that th there are two warring schools of thought on the sign convention uh, about mu. And uh, um, mine is different from the sign convention in most of the uh, case stability literature. So, but I think it's the you know in terms of the limits, it's the natural. So, for example, in GIT, Mumford throws in a minus sign just to make it come out positive. So I didn't want to do that. Uh, and there's this is my one piece of, of Beamerology. This is just that the converse of all those statements is true, except the one that's false on the third line. <laughs> Um, and that's, that's the, the Hilbert Mumford numerical criteria, and, and that's fundamentally the way that we try to test for stability. We don't try to find invariance, we try to analyze this numerical criteria. And, and the, the, so the proof of this is somehow you have, you know, it's based on the value of criterion, and you use the, the Kartani Wahori Matsumoto decomposition to sort of push a punctured disk into an equivariant punctured disk for some one parameter subgroup. If you care about the one parameter subgroup, which fixed the W, then fine. Ah. Maybe if, if you add uh, some words about the one parameter subgroup lambda, which fixes W. Yeah, OK, I see. It's fine. Yes, and I, I see what you're saying. You have to have, uh, yeah, you have to have less than, you have to have less than or equal to zero for the other ones for polystable. Yeah, okay. Good, yeah. Okay, yeah. So let me say that again, just so that uh, the audience can actually hear. So, so, so here, well, I, th we need to add to this condition, this condition for all land. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So and now we can, let's actually see how this goes in you know an example that goes back really to the dawn of the subject. In fact, I mean, the, where did Hilbert get his name on the Hilbert Mumford numerical criterion? I mean, it was really applied to to this example. I mean, he proved the Hilbert basis theorem in fact to kill this industry of actually trying to compute the invariance of binary quantics. Um, and then he needed to have a procedure to actually analyze um, the stability without computing the invariance. And so that's where this came from. So I'm just thinking of this as a polynomial in uh, two variables, x and y, of degree d. And uh, you know, since SL2 is acting, there really is only up to scaling one, one parameter subgroup acting by t and t inverse, and that acts, as you can sort of see, by t to the 2i minus d on the monomial x to the i, y to the di. Um, so the coordinates, in this case, the, uh, the, the decomposition in the eigenspace is just given by the monomial. So the coefficients of each monomial are the components of the equation in the eigenspace. So the condition that mu is positive or non-negative is just that the coefficient is zero whenever 2i is less than or less than or equal to d. Um, and so what we're really saying is that 0, 1 is a root of multiplicity uh, greater than or greater than or equal to d over 2. So the, 
the conclusion is that stable just means no root of multiplicity at least d over 2. Semi-stable means no root of multiplicity greater than or equal, greater than d over 2, sorry. Um, and if you have a root of that multiplicity, then the um, closure of the orbit, well, it's an unstable orbit, so it'll contain the origin. The closed orbit that's in the closure of the strictly semi-stable orbits where the polynomial has a root of multiplicity d minus 2 is the polynomial which has two roots of multiplicity d over 2. Um, and I just picked this moment to say that um, it's often easier to when writing down one parameter subgroups rather than sort of diagonalize according to the action to completely diagonalize, pick a basis that's compatible with the eigenspace decomposition and think of the lambda as acting by a bunch of weights, lambda i, which can now be allowed to repeat. Um, so let's, I want to soup this up for a moment to um, actions of tori and I'll just kind of go over this fairly quickly, but again something similar happens. To torus is again abelian, so it acts by characters. We can decompose a representation into eigenspaces. This time the, the characters are indexed by R-tuples of integers, and the state is indexed by characters. Um, and then what we replace the uh, minimum by is something more interesting, something called the state polytope, which is simply the convex hull of those characters whose, com whose W component is non-zero. Um, and there's a duality between one parameter subgroups and characters for a torus just by composing the character with the one parameter uh, subgroup. And if you use that duality, you can identify the um, numerical invariant mu as simply the minimum of the inner product of the one parameter subgroup with the characters that are in the state of W for which it has a non-zero component. Um, and that um, allows, this gives a slightly more geometric picture of the numerical criterion for these actions which is simply you have this convex, the state polytope, the convex hull of the um, of the states with non-zero components. And to say that W is semi-stable for the whole group T simply means that the origin is in that um, polytope and stable means that the origin is in the interior. So the picture here, I should have probably put one in, is simply that if the origin is not in the closure, uh, is not in this state polytope, then by Farkas's lemma there's uh, plane through the origin such that the polytope lies strictly on the positive side and that plane is dual to a one parameter. So the normal to that plane gives me a one parameter subgroup that pushes that away. Um, so the, the reason I wanted to go through that analysis is because in this case we can sort of see that there is for an unstable vector a kind of canonical choice of one parameter, bad one parameter subgroup. Namely, we, we, so far we could have just scaled all the weights with which lambda acts and we'll scale the mu. So it doesn't really have a kind of invariant notion. The way to get rid of that is just to divide by a suitably invariant uh, norm on the one parameter subgroups and the standard one is just the square root of the sum of the squares of the, um, of the powers with which it acts on a basis. Um, and so now that we, um, conversely, you know, we, we have a sort of a dual notion of lengths on the character space. And so if you think of this polytope, if it's unstable, it doesn't contain the origin. It has to contain a unique shortest vector. And a, this is going to be a supporting hyperplane. Uh, well, the, the, there will be a, a direction pointing to that vector and the normal to that direction will be a supporting hyperplane that's kind of a canonical choice for which in fact if you think about it for a moment the um, the lambda weight 
will be max the normalized lambda weight mu hat will be maximal. And then you can soup this up to larger groups by if you can find a way of making the metric invariant under the vial group, the normalizer of a maximal torus. Um, and there are, there's always a way to do that. And for a group like SLN, there's actually a canonical choice. Um, and so to sort of state the, to, to generalize the idea that there's a unique worst one parameter subgroup, we need to introduce something called the parabolic sub, oops, sorry. Uh, whoops, that was, um, the parabolic subgroup of, uh, associated to lambda, which is just the uh, elements of the group uh, which have a limit when conjugated um, by lambda. Um, and I think a more concrete way to think of this is to think of, uh, of a filtration of, the, of lambda as giving you a filtration a sequence of subspaces where on each um, subquotient of the filtration, lambda acts uh, by homothetes, and the power with which it's act are chosen so that they're decreasing. And then um, the, the parabolic subgroup P of lambda simply consists, is the parabolic of block uh, diagonal matrices preserving that filtration. So the, that's a cocktail. And, the, and you get some nice invariant, invariance properties, which uh, won't be that Im important. The, the upshot of all this is a theorem that was proved in the late 70s by Kempf and Rousseau. Uh, and it says that if we fix one of these invariant norms and we have an unstable point, then we can choose an almost, a, a, an as canonical as possible worst one parameter subgroup. So we're going to define something to be worst if the normalized mu, the mu hat, is, uh, is um, you know, achieves its maximum on lambda. That's the bad direction. And then the first statement is that that maximum is achieved. Um, and if you think about it, 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 if it is achieved, then it's achieved by any p lambda conjugate of a lambda that achieves it. But in fact, all the one parameter subgroups that are worst for a given W are simply one conjugacy class in some parabolic, which is the parabolic of all of them, and so you can associate that to the vector W. So sort of think of an unstable W as determining a parabolic a filtration and then some set of weights on the stages of that filtration. And then I'll just say quickly, a, a, a useful observation is that the stabilizer of W lies inside that parabolic. And so that, that statement can be quite useful, at least for semi-simple G, if you know that the stabilizer is big. So Kemp, one of Kemp's applications is he uses this uh, in cases where the stabilizer acts irreducibly then you can get a very cheap proof of the semi-stability of Chow and Hilbert points of homogeneous spaces and, and very ample models of abelian varieties. And if I have time at the end, I might give a ex recent extension, say a word about a recent extension to this. It, it's enough, in fact, to know that W is not irreducible but multiplicity free, and you can make also some interesting um, applications because you can reduce checking G semi stability to checking semi stability for the right torus. That's a much easier uh, problem. Okay, so finally another example, An another hoary example that's in almost every reference on this subject uh, is plain cubics. But it sort of, I mean, again, it's hoary because it's a good example. So again, the coefficients of the monomials, those are the characters simply now correspond to monomials in this case. The coefficients are the uh, comp components of an equation in each character space. So we're really asking what coefficients of the equation vanish. And so I, the, a one parameter subgroup, I've drawn a little barycentric triangle showing the coordinates. So the red one up at the top is x cubed. Um, the gray line is the hyperplane through the barycenter, so that 
a little brown one in the middle, that's the, the origin in these coordinates. Uh, and it happens to have uh, weights minus 5, 1, and 4. And then you just, I mean, the, the, uh, the idea that sort of uh, the numerical criterion can have some geometric interpretation is, is exemplified in this example that we just say, well, what does it mean for that red coordinate at the top to vanish? That just means that the x cubed term is 0. So 1, 0, 0 is on the, is on the curve. And if it is on the curve, we can sort of, uh, up to change of coordinates, arrange that the tangent line is z equals 0. And that'll make the blue dot vanish. But we can't make the green dot vanish unless we now make 1, 0, 0 a double point. And then if we do that, then we can again make the I don't know what color that was. I think that's supposed to be an orange dot there. Uh, the, <coughs> the y squared x coefficient vanished by making z equals 0 tangent to a branch at the double point. And now, we're, it, it, you know, now we've got something that's strictly semi-stable. We can sort of, we've made everything that's on the, on the plus side of that gray line vanish. So uh, something with a, a node is at at best, semi-stable. And if we want to get that brown dot to vanish and make things actually unstable, then we have to have a cusp for worse singularity. We have to have the tangent cone at that double point be z squared equal to 0. So those are definitely uh, unstable. And in fact, the you know up to change of coordinates uh, and rotating the symmetries of that triangle and wiggling the line, the gray line, a little bit, this is true in any system of coordinates. So this, is, this analysis, since these conditions are geometric and don't refer to the coordinate system, we can just say this is what stability means in this case. And so as a little complement to this, I mean, this is, does happen to be one case where we actually know what the invariants are. Um, so the, the condition that they both um, that they both vanish, uh, they're the coefficients of the Weierstrass form. And you can see when they both vanish, what do you have as a cuspidal cubic in general. Um, and I've drawn here, took the uh, opportunity to draw here the different kinds of unstable orbits. So where I make more and more of the coefficients vanish. And in each case, the red line is the worst one parameter subgroup sort of translated so it's shown as supporting some coefficients there. And the way these are ordered is that the distance from the brown dot to the red line is increasing. And I'll just say that this picture was, this is a sort of a baby version of a picture that Hesselink building on Kemp's theorem showed with the, the maximum of mu hat stratifies the unstable locus or the null cone as it's known. Uh, so th this is, a, th I'm just going to sort of point to the sort of symplectic wing uh, and leave others to, um, to go into it in more detail. But uh, there's one more stability criterion that's important, and that is that it, um, if I um, fix a maximal compact, so for, for SL, think of the special unitary group. Um, and just think of an, you know, a standard um, Hermitian inner product, um, then I can define a length function on orbits by simply taking the square of the length of g of w. And Kemp and Ness proved that that function has very uh, special properties. Any critical point is, in fact, a point where the minimum is attained. Um, and that minimum is attained if and only if the orbit is closed. So you get a poly stability criterion. Uh, and the, minute, the minimum is taken on the smallest possible set, a single double KGW uh, coset. And in directions uh, normal to that um, coset, that has strictly positive variation, second partials. Um, and then you, you get, uh, if you think about the, in, the sort of induced function on the single coset, you get a Morse function with a unique minimum if and only if the point is stable. 
Um, so this, um, you know, th this opens, as I said, the, the door to symplectic techniques because it turns out that the zeros of this length function are, um, the, the critical points of this length function, sorry, are zeros of a momentum map associated to the Lie algebra of that uh, maximal compact subgroup. And uh, so, in fact, this was originally studied by Ness and, and Kirwan, and the gradient flow of M is another way to recover that uh, stratification of the unstable locus. And so I think you're probably you know, going to hear more about this this, this afternoon. So. OK, so a few words about trying to get beyond the uh, linear case. Um, it's, let me just say, straightforward to uh, pass to more general actions on affine varieties. Um, and I'm going to jump, in fact, to asking the question, can we imitate that for, in particular, actions on projective varieties? Because there you need to introduce an important new ingredient, uh, which is something called a linearization of a line bundle. So what that amounts to is a lift of your G, the G action on your variety to the total space of some line bundle up above it, fixing the zero section, so acting by homothetes in the fiber. Um, and it's some work, but not too hard to check that the, the, these things form a group, which is denoted by pick G, the sort of group of linearized line bundles. Um, and that that group is related to the ordinary Picard group by a little exact sequence. And under nice hypotheses, relatively mild hypotheses um, on X, the, the, the co-kernel is the Picard group of the group that's acting. And the kernel is the character group of the group that's acting. And in the, important, the example that will be important to us, where the group is SLN, both of those vanish. And so the upshot is that you can linearize any, any line bundle if the x is not too pathological and in a unique way. Um, but another uh, sort of door that I'm passing by is cases where there are, uh, lot, wh where there are lots of interesting line bundles you could choose to linearize. That's a subject called VGIT, and, and Rado is the person to ask about, about that. So let's fix one ample line bundle um, and a linearization on that. And let me just say that you get a good categorical quotient. Um, and I'll let you look at the sort of details of this. Essentially, the idea is that if you pick an ample bundle, the section ring is going to be finitely generated. So the invariant section ring will be finitely generated too. And you can produce a quotient which locally looks like what we've been talking about by taking the proj of that uh, section ring. Um, and you know, one, th one sort of important uh, application of that construction is that uh, as it's a proj, it comes with a natural ample uh, line bundle on it. And uh, you can generally pull back that line bundle uh, modulo taking uh, powers to something um, on the original X and use the Groton de Riemann rock to kind of compare those bundles in an effective way. And for people who are interested in using GIT to study birational geometry of moduli spaces, this is a very effective way to get information to construct kind of ample classes and models of moduli space. OK, so we're into the sort of second half of the, the talk here. Um, the rest of the talk is going to be about Hilbert points. And I'm going to go over this fairly quickly, because I think, Rob, you gave a limpid introductory lecture to, to most of this same audience. On. So but let's just r remind ourselves of the idea is that um, I th want to think of a subvariety of a projective space as associated to a map from the dual of that space to sections 
of a line bundle on that variety. Um, not necessarily surjective or injective. Um, and then we're going to uh, fix a Hilbert polynomial, which is just the eventual, for large m, dimension of the space of sections of the mth twist of that line bundle. And uh, standard kind of boundedness results about the Hilbert scheme tell us that we get an exact sequence relating the ideal of the variety in degree m, which is a set of homogeneous polynomials of degree m. Uh, which I think of as sections of O of M, and then I can restrict those sections to the variety Y, and if M is large enough, I'll get a surjective map. Um, so since that right-hand term, the H naught of Y, has a, a predictable dimension, P of M, I can take that top exterior power of that restriction map and get a map whose image is just C, and hence think of the coordinates of that uh, the dually as that map as giving me uh, a point in the projective space associated to this um, top symmetric power. And I sort of think of that point as the Hilbert point of Y. So HP is going to be the Hilbert scheme of subschemes with Hilbert polynomial P. And I think of that, those points as being determined by the P of M dimensional quotient in my notation, that's the H naught of Y, of the polynomials of degree M. And we're going to, you don't really need to have digested all that um, too well, because we're going to be able to sort of boil down the numerical criterion for those Hilbert points into something much more concrete. Uh, so I'll simply say that um, just by pulling back the O of 1 on P of W, we get a natural, naturally linearized line bundle on the Hilbert scheme. But notice that line bundle depends on the degree we picked to fix uh, this, this picture. Um, and varying that degree is actually something that will come up uh, in, a, in a few moments. Okay. So what does the numerical criterion say? Well, I, this is one case where I want to sort of start with an, I want to think of the group that's acting as the special linear group of the ambient projective space. I want to fully diagonalize any one parameter subgroup with weights lambda. And I sort of think of that as a weighted basis. So as I say, I'm trying to make the numerical criterion as concrete as possible. So that, that induces a basis, we've already seen examples of this, by monomials on the space of homogeneous polynomials of degree m. And you just sort of dot the exponent vector with the weight vector to get the weight of that monomial. And then if we want to go to an exterior power, I should use as my coordinates the Pluker coordinates, which are wedges of p of m that's the wedge product we're taking, distinct monomials. And the weight there just is obtained by summing the weights of the individual monomials. So the key observation is in this line here. What does it mean for one of these Pluker coordinates to be non-zero at a Hilbert point? This is the only point you really need to understand. That means that the either the wedge product is non-zero at that point, And where did that come from? That came from restricting that set of monomials to y, mapping them into h naught of y. So they have to be linearly independent in h naught of oy. And since the dimension of that space is the number of monomials, they'll have to form a monomial basis. And so that gives you a sort of numerical criterion for Hilbert points that I think of just taking a weighted basis on the ambient space with the sum of the weights adding to 0, so I get a special linear one parameter subgroup. And I ask, can I always find a basis BM of monomials of the sections of OY of M, which has negative or non-positive weight? So this is just, so we're going to think of the, the Hilbert Mumford invariant as weights of monomial bases. So we can actually do an example 
here. Um, the Steiner surface, so this is, a, th this is an example that's dear to my heart because it's sort of what was the genesis of my thesis. Um, so it, you can think of that as the projection of the Veronese from a point on it or as the image of a ruled surface, but I'm going to think of it the most convenient point of view for this analysis is as the blow up of P2 at 0, 0, 1 embedded by quadrics passing through that uh, point. And that's useful because it gives me a natural basis for the uh, sections of O of 1 on that surface in P4 as just mono, all the monomials except the monomial Z squared, which doesn't vanish at 0, 0, 1. And then the way I will pick my weights is essentially I will, I will, my lambda will assign z weight minus 4 and x and y weight 1. And then I get a basis of this basis b1, whose weights, as you can see, are 2, 2, 2, minus 3, and minus 3. So that's an SL one parameter subgroup. Um, and I just want to, now I'm supposed to think about degree m monomials in the elements of that basis, and just by their interpretation in terms of x, y, and z, I can think of those as monomials of total degree 2m in x, y, and z, having degree at most m in z. So I can tell you what the weight of such a monomial is. It's determined by its z degree, and I can tell you how many of them there are. There's just one more than the complementary degree. So a little bit of algebra allows me to add, the, add up those products of number of monomials times their weights and find out the weight of any monomial basis, which is, as you see here, is positive at least for m at least 2. So the Steiner surface is an example of a variety with an unstable Hilbert point. And in fact, I mean, so uh, this is the start of a big, uh, a big industry. In fact, this sort of relation between stability of Hilbert points and this, this as a projective bundle is a mildly slope unstable projective bundle on P1. And in fact, there turns out to be quite an extensive equivalence between st stability of vector bundles in the Giesecker sense and stability of the Hilbert points of the associated rule varieties. And, and Zhao Wei is the person who can tell you uh, everything about that. So. OK, so I, I, the problem with that example is that I cheated by sort of understanding completely what monomials meant. Um, but I didn't really need to use the full weight of my cheating. And so that's the, that's the next idea, is that I really only needed to understand sort of properties of the weight filtration. What weights occurred in o, o y of m and how many of each were there? And that was really determined only by, not by the actual basis that I chose in, uh, on, on v, but merely by the filtration by lambda weights that, that was induced by that basis. So that's what this uh, picture here is saying is that I'm just going to sort of associate to a lambda a filtration. That's just the same flag that we saw associated to the parabolic earlier on. And then a choice on each subquotient of a weight ordered so that they're decreasing. Um, and then the advantage of that is that I can now talk about weights of polynomials. It's the weight of a polynomial is simply the largest weight of any monomial occurring in it. And I can think of weights of any basis of the sections of O, Y of M. Um, and I gain the advantage that I'm not really required anymore to sort of pick my weights so that they're integral and sum to 0. I can scale them and shift them as long as I track the effect of that scaling and shifting on the bases. And so a convenient invariant to introduce is the average of the lambda i's, which I'll call alpha. Um, and then the shifting that I need is, well, there are p of m elements in a basis. Each of them contains, is a mono, you know, is of homogeneous of degree m in the coordinates that I've chosen. 
and I need to shift each of those coordinates by alpha. So just subtracting m p of m alpha from the weight of uh, basis, where now the basis doesn't have to consist of monomials, the sign of that difference becomes the uh, condition for stability or semi-stability of a Hilbert point. Um, so let me, I, I think I'll just uh, skip over this, but this is just kind of a his, historical remark um, that, um, you know, one thing we would like to uh, do with the, um, with stable Hilbert points is construct moduli spaces. Um, and the way to do that, we, we, you know, a point of a Hilbert scheme is not just an abstract variety, it's an abstract variety plus a line bundle plus the basis of the sections. And GIT is a way of getting rid of the basis of the sections, but we also need to get rid of the line bundle. And there's an obvious way to do that by making it canonical or a multiple of the canonical bundle. So that's sort of a strategy to try to do this, is to take some large multiple of the canonical bundle and look inside the corresponding Hilbert stream at the locus, which I'm going to call K, of points that are actually embedded by a multiple of their canonical bundle try to close that up and take a quotient. Uh, and, you know, we somehow see curves of, if we did this for curves, we would see mg, the smooth curves of genus g, as a dense open in that space. But if, I'm sure Rob told you in his lectures, that when you close that up, all hell breaks loose. Uh, you know, you'll see all kinds of horrible things. And so, uh, uh, you know, a question is what's going to happen at the boundary of the quotient? Um, and so if you go back to the sort of plain cubic example and you start thinking about doing the same kind of analysis for curves in the plane of higher degree, that barycenter, that brown point, kind of moves down the triangle. And so you can make more and more and more rows of coefficients at the top zero. Meaning that, you know, for large degree, those plane curves can be stable and have absolutely horrible singularities on them. Um, and I think, you know, that Mumford thought that this was a general phenomenon. Um, but in fact, what we're going to see, and this is, I think, one of the themes that comes out even more strongly from the working case stability, is that by taking the multiple A to be large, you eliminate all this pathology, that there are horrible points at the boundary of K in the Hilbert scheme, but the GIT magically erases them. Um, and so I might be able to say a little bit about that. This is my attempt. I, I want to at least show you that um, if the degree is large enough, you can't have a triple point or something worse on the Hilbert point, uh, on a, st a stable Hilbert point of a curve. So at least there's some limit to how bad things can be. Um, so the idea is rather similar to the idea in the, in the Steiner surface. You sort of look at the geometry of the surface. So in the Steiner surface, what was I, I should have said, what was I really looking at? The, the weight filtration there was just uh, adapted to the exceptional divisor of the blow up of P2 at the point. Um, in this case, if I've got a triple point, I want to take a filtration that sort of looks at the triple point. So I do something pretty simple. I just, allow, I just have two weights. Weight one if the section doesn't vanish at the triple point, and weight zero for all the others. And now I ne you need to you know, wave your hands a little bit, but I'm just going to say that upon the normalization, that um, you know, what, what gets generated by um, sections of weight at most w minus j. In other words, having at least j factors vanishing at the triple point is the complete linear series on the normalization vanishing j-fold at each of the three pre-images of the triple point. And that, I think, is not too hard to swallow. So the point is we know the kind of co-dimension of the weight at most w minus j subspace. And that, in that previous um, stability criterion, that's what we need to understand, weights of basis. We need to really understand what the number of each weight is. So now I do some more, a little more algebra. You do a little bit more calculation this time. 
and you come out with this uh, estimate for the mu. No, it's not an estimate. You can, um, under the assumptions I'm making, you can calculate it exactly. And, if, and so you see two things that are quite general. One is that the, these uh, mu's themselves are sort of graded Hilbert polynomials. In this case, we had a curve, and we get not a polynomial of degree 1, but of degree 2. And th that's going to be a, a general fact. And of course, in that case, really, if the leading coefficient of that polynomial has a sign, then the polynomial has a sign, again, at least for large M. So this is, so here we're actually, um, it, as it happens in this case, the, the other coefficients are visibly positive, so it doesn't matter. But in general, we're going to have to take the M to be very large if we want to sort of use that idea that the sign of the leading coefficient determines the sign of mu. But in any case, what we see in this case is certainly if the degree over the um, dimension of the ambient projective space is less than 3 halves, then we've got something unstable. And so now think about what riemann roch says. riemann roch says that n is d minus g plus 1. So all we have to do is let g get relatively large, and we can make, in fact, we can make d over n as close to 1 as we like for curves. And in general, there's some fact factorial that tells you how, how small you can make that. So th this is kind of uh, the illustration of the way sort of things, pathologies get erased in, in, in GIT. Um, I'm going to skip. Uh, this, this is a more uh, subtle example. Um, let me say, I, yeah, so I think I'm just going to skip this example and let you look at it in the um, in the slides at your leisure, but if you, you know, th this essentially, what, what I wanted to, the point I wanted to make about um, this example is um, twofold that the, um, it, when we allow reducible varieties, so this is sort of something more on the algebraic geometry side than the than the case stability side, um, things get more subtle. Okay, so what this example shows is that um, I can allow a reducible curve with an elliptic tail hanging off it if the canonical multiple is at least 5. But if the canonical multiple becomes 4 or less, I can't. And I will simply uh, say that even s there's something even subtler in this example. In the calculation I make, I glue the elliptic tail at the point P, so there's going to be some, the embedding is going to be some linear series on that elliptic curve. It has degree D. I can write that linear series as D times P for some point on the elliptic curve. And I glue at that point. Okay, and then I come out with this kind of d over g ratio of 8 sevenths, which comes from basically this 2 there. Let me just say that. What if I glued at a different point? I took the same linear series, but glued at a different point. Then this 2 turns into a 3, and the ratio of the d over g minus 1 turns into a 7 6. So it's, it's not just the sort of abstract geometry of the curve. It's exactly how it's sitting in the projective space that matters. And for example, for those pe people who are interested in the birational geometry of moduli spaces, one place where people are stuck is that it turns out that if you go from elliptic tails to genus 2 tails, that the flip of stability happens not as you vary the uh, multiple A, but as you vary the M, the linearization multiple. And that's actually one of the big kind of open problems in, in the area. OK, so let me sort of sum up what um, you know, my philosophy of, of GIT is that instability is geometry, and stability is combinatorics. You notice that in all the examples I've done, uh, pretty much, I, I've cheated by kind of telling you what the unstable locus is. And I haven't done too many examples to show you um, that 
uh, that things are stable, and there's a reason. It's much, much harder to prove that things are stable than to prove that they're unstable. Because you need to handle, to prove something's unstable, you get to pick your one parameter subgroup, you adapt it to the geometry, and as we've seen, you can sort of get good estimates on the weight filtration. To prove something is stable or semi-stable, you need to throw a dart at the dartboard of one parameter subgroups, and whatever those weights are, which has nothing to do with the geometry of your variety, you somehow have to estimate that weight filtration. Um, and, you know, so the, uh, the, in general, this has only been possible by the estimates only tell you about the sign of the leading coefficient if it has a sign. And fortunately, it generally does. Um, so that's the asymptotic in M numerical criterion for Hilbert points. I simply say that this weighted basis is, in general, uh, represented by a polynomial of degree 1 greater than the dimension of the variety. And if the leading coefficient of that polynomial has a sign, then we can conclude stability at least for large values of the linearization parameter. And here's the only thing I will say about chow points is that that leading coefficient turns out to be the mu uh, for the, the chow point of the corresponding variety. And so you get a, just from the fact that if a, a polynomial ha has a sign, if its leading coefficient does, and if the polynomial has a sign, then the leading coefficient has to at least be non-negative you get these implications between the various notions of Chow and Hilbert's stability and semi-stability. And if you go back and look at that elliptic tail example, you will see that it shows that all the converses are, in general, false, although they frequently hold in practice. Um, so again, another sort of passing by another door that I think you'll hear about from Yuji in considerably greater um, detail this afternoon, this is a really an asymptotic in L. It's like letting the A go to infinity in the canonical. Uh, whoops, sorry. Um, notion is simply to take that weight function and tr um, try to sort of do the asymptotics in two steps. Sort of fir start first go out to a case where you think of the O of 1 as some large power of a line bundle and then compare what happens in that degree to what happens in some large multiple of that degree. And you can expand the, uh, you know, so you, you write down this kind of um, difference of scaled weight functions in those two degrees, and the point of the coefficients that are multiplying them is that when you expand that uh, difference, as a polynomial in both of the variables, S and L, you've arranged for the top coefficient jointly to vanish. And then the Donaldson-Futaki invariant of the one-parameter subgroup lambda is, because of the sign convention, minus the R, R plus 1 coefficient. So degree R in S, degree R plus 1 in L. And K stability, uh, or semi-stability, is uh, um, so I've, got the, I've got these, not only got this misspelled, but I've got these inequalities backwards here. Uh, for all what are called test configurations, but those are really, those amount to, not, uh, to one parameter subgroups acting on the sections of a power of S. Um, but, uh, and, and we can likewise speak about asymptotic, this is not asymptotic in M, but asymptotic in the degree, Hilbert or Chow. Um, semi-stability by letting the S go to infinity. And again, the same observations about the relations between the sign of a leading coefficient and the sign of a polynomial give you a bunch of implications between the asymptotic notions for Chow and Hilbert's semi-stability. Those are just the ones from the previous slide. And then the weakest notion is that of K uh, semi-stability. Uh, and if you think about the quantification of which one parameter subgroups you're dealing with here, you will see that you don't have all the ones you need to make a conclusion here. Even though this case stability looks like a, a sort of stronger condition, 
the you don't you don't actually see all the one parameter subgroups you need to put in that other arrow okay so let me try to sort of wind up fairly quickly um, by saying that I, I think you know the this is this was probably a little ambitious on my part to say this. so let me simply say you know if we want how do how are we ever going to prove stability well, w the answer is we aren't very often. You know. uh, but what we try to do for Hilbert points is to estimate the weight filtration. And one way you can try to do that is to find some subspaces. I mean, this is what I did in my examples. Find some subspaces where you understand the maximum weight and you understand the dimension. And if you have a filtration by such spaces, you get pretty trivially some kind of estimates on the WB of M. And then the question is, how can you find such subspaces? And so the one general criterion along this line is to basically take um, this, the, one of the stages in the lambda filtration, look at the line bundle that it generates, and then take a power of that line bundle a power of the line bundle according to another stage of the filtration, and then throw in a little something very ample for technical purposes. Um, and when you do that, you can use Riemann rock to estimate the dimensions of those spaces. And by choosing the spaces to be um, parts of the filtration, you are, they come with an estimate on their weights. And uh, so what comes out is a criterion which I'm only writing down for Hilbert points of curves, and uh, I think if you if you're horrified that will my 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 goal will have been achieved for this criterion. You know it involves um, first of all uh, a maximum over the possible choices of weights. That's sort of in the picture. That's the numerical criterion part. Uh, but then the combinatorial part is in that minimum there is that you play a game with the devil in which the, you, know, you, you pick the filtration so that the degrees of these pieces aren't too big. And then the devil tries to pick the, one parameter, the weights of the one parameter subgroup so that you don't get a very good estimate. And so that to, in order to get a good estimate, you actually have to work with all kinds of sequences, uh, not just the whole filtration, but any subfiltration. Uh, so that's where the combinatorial uh, difficulty comes in. If you had a higher dimensional variety, uh, you would in fact um, get something in here that involved all the mixed intersection numbers of the line bundles associated to the different pieces in the filtration. Um, but it has roughly the same form. The problem is it's nonlinear. In this case, essentially using the linearity and the fact that Riemann Rock and Clifford give you uniform estimates for the degrees of these bundles. And these EIs, I didn't say them, but they were the drop in degree as we move down in this picture. We get uniform estimates for those. Uh, and it turns out that you can reinterpret that big ugly sum as uh, computing the area of a lower convex envelope and then apply a linear programming argument to conclude that, in fact, for a degree bigger than a 2G plus 1, um, smooth curves of genus G embedded by complete linear series of degree at least D have smooth, have stable mth Hilbert points. And that's what you need to kind of get started with the stability argument. OK, so truth in advertising. Um, everything I've said is a lie, you know, in the sense that you know, when you try to do this uh, for anything but smooth curves, it doesn't work so well. You can't actually you know, get estimates that are sharp enough, and you can't do the combinatorics. But in fact, the one exception to that statement is that Giesecker originally developed this criterion in order to prove the asymptotic stability of pluricanonical models of surfaces of general type, uh, a paper that Mumford refers to as the fight Thompson of algebraic geometry. Uh, you know, so, but it's a real tour de force. Okay. Um, but those weight filtrations that I was writing down, for example, they don't allow you to show the stability of nodal curves, even, um, or smooth pointed curves. 
So how are you ever going to compactify? Um, you know, we, we, get, we can build a GIT quotient that gives us subspace like mg, but how would we ever get mg bar? We can't prove that anything is semi-stable. Uh, well, in, in some cases you can. So th there are better criteria, and in fact, the stability of nodal curves was recently proved by Jun Li and, and Xiao Wei Wang, um, and Swinarski handled pointed smooth curves, but it's a lot harder. There's some serious combinatorics, and I really know of no attempt to do this in higher dimension. Um, so I'll simply say that uh, something I think, again, you're likely to hear about more today is that there is a kind of differential geometric condition, uh, that a condition on the restriction of the uh, Fubini Studi metric to a suitably chosen point in the orbit that lets you deduce Chow stability. And taking limits of those metrics is what leads to the constant scalar curvature side of the picture. Um, so I wanted to say this. Uh, for Radu, but I think I'll skip. I'll, I will simply say the point of this slide is that there is a way to check uh, stability by cheating, by using the evaluative criterion. So the, the basic idea is that if you want to prove stability of singular things, you smooth them to things whose stability you know, and this semi-stable replacement, the evaluative criterion, lets you fill into a new family that has a semi-stable central limit. And if you know enough about what things might be semi-stable, and that's the easy side, you say this is unstable, that's unstable, then you can actually show, using a kind of semi-stable reduction argument, that those two central fibers, the one you started with and the one that you got by semi-stable replacement, are the same. And so that's essentially how you construct uh, compact quotients, and um, it's been extended, and is being, so this, this plan is now quite an active area of research um, in the birational geometry, the so-called log minimal model program of Hassett and Keel for MG bar. I think I'll, I'll skip over that. So let me say a word about, I, I, I have a, just a couple of invariants. So a sort of place that you can find a lot of the things I said in the first part of the talk actually proved. Uh, that's you know pretty easy to, to read is a set of lectures of Igor Dolgachev, um, the, the sort of you know the Bible of the subject now in its its third edition, but really I think not the first place to go to learn the subject is Mumford's book uh, GIT, which has a, which does have a very nice uh, chapter on moment maps. Um, Kemp's paper on instability is the best place to see the numerical criterion done in its full uh, generality. And then I discovered in researching this lovely uh, set of lecture notes by Chris Woodward, which really is the most complete introduction to the moment map sides of this that I've seen. Um, so, you know, uh, these are some references. Uh, don't try this at home, kids. Uh, you know, um, this is the sort of reference for the material on balanced metrics. This is kind of a reasonably gentle introduction to the stuff I skipped about proving some things that are, that are stable. And then this is really where a lot of the ideas about proving um, semi-stability of Hilbert points can be found. It's still a pretty good place to look for reference. Give the questions. Uh, just, just maybe one question, if please. So the next talk will, so, so we have coffee now, and the next talk is eleven forty-five. Yeah. So. Let's, let's very cool coffee. Sorry, I went a little over. But I just yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I wanted to get some.